This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Recording by Jim Mullins. Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. Chapter 4 The Food Question. Objections to paraffin oil as an atmosphere. Advantages of cheese as a traveling companion. A married woman deserts her home. Further provision for getting upset. I pack. Cussedness of toothbrushes. George and Harris pack. Awful behavior of Montmorency. We retire to rest. Then we discussed the food question. George said... Begin with breakfast. George is so practical. Now for breakfast we shall want a frying pan. Harris said it was indigestible, but we merely urged him not to be an ass, and George went on. A teapot and a kettle and a methylated spirit stove. No oil, said George with a significant look, and Harris and I agreed. We had taken up an oil stove once, but never again. It had been like living in an oil shop that week. It oozed. I never saw such a thing as paraffin oil is to ooze. We kept it in the nose of the boat, and, from there, it oozed down to the rudder, impregnating the whole boat and everything in it on its way. And it oozed over the river, and saturated the scenery and spoilt the atmosphere. Sometimes a westerly oily wind blew, and at other times an easterly oily wind and sometimes it blew a northerly oily wind, and maybe a southerly oily wind. But whether it came from the Arctic snows, or was raised in the waste of the desert sands, it came alike to us laden with the fragrance of paraffin oil. And that oil oozed up and ruined the sunset. And as for the moonbeams, they positively reeked of paraffin. We tried to get away from it at Marlow. We left the boat by the bridge and took a walk through the town to escape it, but it followed us. The whole town was full of oil. We passed through the churchyard, and it seemed as if the people had been buried in oil. The high street stunk of oil. We wondered how people could live in it, and we walked miles upon miles out Birmingham way, but it was no use. The country was steeped in oil. At the end of that trip, we met together at midnight in a lonely field under a blasted oak and took an awful oath. We had been swearing for a whole week about the thing in an ordinary, middle-class way, but this was a swell affair, an awful oath never to take paraffin oil with us in a boat again, except, of course, in case of sickness. Therefore, in the present instance, We confined ourselves to methylated spirit. Even that is bad enough. You get methylated pie and methylated cake. But methylated spirit is more wholesome when taken into the system in large quantities than paraffin oil. For other breakfast things, George suggested eggs and bacon, which were easy to cook. Cold meat, tea, bread, and butter, and jam. For lunch, he said, we could have biscuits cold meat, bread and butter, and jam, but no cheese. Cheese, like oil, makes too much of itself. It wants the whole boat to itself. It goes through the hamper and gives a cheesy flavor to everything else there. You can't tell whether you are eating apple pie or German sausage or strawberries and cream. It all seems cheese. There is too much odor about cheese. I remember a friend of mine, buying a couple of cheeses at Liverpool. Splendid cheeses they were, ripe and mellow, and with a 200-horsepower scent about them that might have been warranted to carry three miles and knock a man over at 200 yards. I was in Liverpool at the time, and my friend said that if I didn't mind, he would get me to take them back with me to London, as he should not be coming up for a day or two himself, and he did not think the cheeses ought to be kept much longer. Oh, with pleasure, dear boy, I replied, with pleasure. I called for the cheeses and took them away in a cab. It was a ramshackle affair, dragged along by a knock-kneed, 
broken-winded somnambulist, which his owner, in a moment of enthusiasm, during conversation, referred to as a horse. I put the cheeses on top, and we started off at a shamble that would have done credit to the swiftest steamroller ever built, and all went merry as a funeral bell until we turned the corner. There, the wind carried a whiff from the cheeses full onto our steed. It woke him up, and with a snort of terror, he dashed off at three miles an hour. The wind still blew in his direction, and before we reached the end of the street, he was laying himself out at a rate of nearly four miles an hour, leaving the cripples and stout old ladies simply nowhere. It took two porters, as well as the driver, to hold him in at the station and I do not think they would have done it even then had not one of the men had the presence of mind to put a handkerchief over his nose and to light a bit of brown paper. I took my ticket and marched proudly up the platform with my cheeses, the people falling back respectfully on either side. The train was crowded, and I had to get into a carriage where there were already seven other people. One crusty old gentleman objected, but I got in, notwithstanding, and, putting my cheese upon the rack, squeezed down with a pleasant smile and said it was a warm day. A few moments passed, and then the old gentleman began to fidget. Very close in here, he said. Quite oppressive, said the man next him. And then they both began sniffing, and at the third sniff they caught it right on the chest, and rose up without another word and went out. And then a stout lady got up and said it was disgraceful that a respectable married woman should be harried about in this way, and gathered up a bag and ate parcels and went. The remaining four passengers sat on for a while, until a solemn-looking man in the corner, who, from his dress and general appearance, seemed to belong to the undertaker class, said it put him in mind of a dead baby, and the other three passengers tried to get out of the door at the same time and hurt themselves. I smiled at the black gentleman and said I thought we were going to have the carriage to ourselves, and he laughed pleasantly and said that some people made such a fuss over a little thing. But even he grew strangely depressed after we had started, and so when we reached Crewe I asked him to come and have a drink. He accepted, and we forced our way into the buffet, where we yelled and stamped and waved our umbrellas for a quarter of an hour, and then a young lady came and asked us if we wanted anything. "'What's yours?' I said, turning to my friend. "'I'll have half a crown's worth of brandy, neat, if you please, miss,' he responded. And he went off quietly after he had drunk it and got into another carriage, which I thought mean. From crew I had the compartment to myself, though the train was crowded." As we drew up at the different stations, the people, seeing my empty carriage, would rush for it. Here you are, Maria, come along, plenty of room. All right, Tom, we'll get in here, they would shout, and they would run along carrying heavy bags and fight round the door to get in first. And one would open the door and mount the steps and stagger back into the arms of the man behind him, and they would all come and have a sniff and then droop off and squeeze into other carriages or pay the difference and go first. From Houston, I took the cheeses down to my friend's house. When his wife came into the room, she smelt round for an instant. Then she said, What is it? Tell me the worst. I said, It's cheeses. Tom bought them in Liverpool and asked me to bring them up with me. And I added that I hoped she understood that it had nothing to do with me. And she said that she was sure of that, but that she would speak to Tom about it when he came back. My friend was detained in Liverpool longer than he expected, and, three days later, as he hadn't returned home, his wife called on me. She said, What did Tom say about those cheeses? I replied that he had directed they were to be kept in a moist place and that nobody was to touch them. She said, Nobody's likely to touch them. Had he smelt them? I thought he had, and that had that he seemed greatly attached to them. You think he would be upset, she queried, if I gave a man a sovereign to take them away and bury them? I answered that I thought he would never smile again. An idea struck her. She said, Do you mind keeping them for him? Let me send them round to you. 
Madam, I replied, for myself, I like the smell of cheese, and the journey the other day with them from Liverpool I shall ever look back upon as a happy ending to a pleasant holiday. But in this world we must consider others. The lady under whose roof I have the honor of residing is a widow, and for all I know, possibly an orphan too. She has a strong, I may say an eloquent, objection to being what she terms put upon. The presence of your husband's cheeses in her house she would, I instinctively feel, regard as a put upon. And it shall never be said that I put upon the widow and the orphan. Very well, then, said my friend's wife, rising. All I have to say is that I shall take the children and go to an hotel until those cheeses are eaten. I decline to live any longer in the same house with them. She kept her word, leaving the place in charge of the charwoman, who, when asked if she could stand the smell, replied, What smell? And who, when taken close to the cheeses and told to sniff hard, said she could detect a faint odor of melons. It was argued from this that little injury could result to the woman from the atmosphere, and she was left. The hotel bill came to fifteen guineas, and my friend, after reckoning everything up, found that the cheeses had cost him eight and sixpence a pound. He said he dearly loved a bit of cheese, but it was beyond his means, so he determined to get rid of them, and threw them into the canal, but had to fish them out again, as the bargemen complained. They said it made them feel quite faint. And after that, he took them one dark night and left them in the parish mortuary. But the coroner discovered them and made a fearful fuss. He said it was a plot to deprive him of his living by waking up the corpses. My friend got rid of them at last by taking them down to a seaside town and burying them on the beach. It gained the place quite a reputation. Visitors said they had never noticed before how strong the air was, and weak-chested and consumptive people used to throng there for years afterward. Fond as I am of cheese, therefore, I hold that George was right in declining to take any. We shan't want any tea, said George. Harris's face fell at this. But we'll have a good round, square, slap-up meal at seven. Dinner, tea, and supper combined. Harris grew more cheerful. George suggested meat and fruit pies, cold meat, tomatoes, fruit, and green stuff. For drink, we took some wonderful sticky concoction of Harris's, which you mixed with water and called lemonade, plenty of tea, and a bottle of whiskey, in case, as George said, we got upset. It seemed to me that George harped too much on the getting upset idea. It seemed to me the wrong spirit to go about the trip in. But I'm glad we took the whiskey. We didn't take beer or wine. They are a mistake up the river. They make you feel sleepy and heavy. A glass in the evening when you are doing a mooch round the town and looking at the girls is all right enough. But don't drink when the sun is blazing down on your head and you've got hard work to do. We made a list of things to be taken, and a pretty lengthy one it was, before we parted that evening. The next day, which was Friday, we got them all together and met in the evening to pack. We got a big gladstone for the clothes and a couple of hampers for the victuals and the cooking utensils. We moved the table up against the window, piled everything in a heap in the middle of the floor, and sat round and looked at it. I said I'd pack. I rather pride myself on my packing. Packing is one of those many things that I feel I know more about than any other person living. It surprises me myself sometimes how many of these subjects there are. I impressed the fact upon George and Harris and told them that they had better leave the whole matter entirely to me. They fell into the suggestion with a readiness that had something uncanny about it. George put on a pipe and spread himself over the easy chair, and Harris cocked his legs on the table and lit a cigar. This was hardly what I intended. What I had meant, of course, was that I should boss the job, and that Harris and George should potter about under my directions. I pushing them aside every now and then with, Oh, you, here, let me do it. There you are, simple enough, really teaching them, as you might say. Their taking it in the way they did irritated me. 
There is nothing does irritate me more than seeing other people sitting about doing nothing when I am working. I lived with a man once who used to make me mad that way. He would loll on the sofa and watch me doing things by the hour together, following me round the room with his eyes wherever I went. He said it did him real good to look on at me messing about. He said it made him feel that life was not an idle dream to be gaped and yawned through, but a noble task full of duty and stern work. He said he often wondered now how he could have gone on before he met me, never having anybody to look at while they worked. Now I'm not like that. I can't sit still and see another man slaving and working. I want to get up and superintend and walk round with my hands in my pocket and tell him what to do. It's my energetic nature. I can't help it. However, I did not say anything but started the packing. It seemed a longer job than I had thought it was going to be, but I got the bag finished at last and I sat on it and strapped it. Ain't you going to put the boots in? said Harris, and I looked round and found I had forgotten them. That's just like Harris. He couldn't have said a word until I'd gotten the bag shut and strapped, of course. And George laughed, one of those irritating, senseless, chuckle headed, crack jawed laughs of his. They do make me so wild. I opened the bag and packed the boots in, and then, just as I was going to close it, a horrible idea occurred to me. Had I packed my toothbrush? I don't know how it is, but I never do know whether I pack my toothbrush. My toothbrush is a thing that haunts me when I'm traveling and makes my life a misery. I dream that I haven't packed it and wake up in a cold perspiration and get out of bed and hunt for it. And in the morning, I pack it before I have used it and have to unpack again to get it. And it is always the last thing I turn out of the bag. And then I repack and forget it and have to rush upstairs for it at the last moment and carry it to the railway station, wrapped up in a pocket handkerchief. Of course, I had to turn every mortal thing out now, and, of course, I could not find it. I rummaged the things up into much the same state that they must have been before the world was created and when chaos reigned. Of course, I found George's and Harris's eighteen times over, but I couldn't find my own. I put the things back one by one and held everything up and shook it. Then I found it inside a boot. I repacked once more. When I had finished, George asked if the soap was in. I said I didn't care a hang whether the soap was in or whether it wasn't, and I slammed the bag to and strapped it, and found that I had packed my tobacco pouch in it and had to reopen it. It got shut up finally at ten five p.m. And then there remained the hampers to do. Harris said that we should be wanting to start in less than twelve hours' time, and thought that he and George had better do the rest. And I agreed and sat down, and they had a go. They began in a light-hearted spirit, evidently intending to show me how to do it. I made no comment; I only waited. When George is hanged, Harris will be the worst packer in this world. And I looked at the piles of plates and cups and kettles and bottles and jars, and pies and stoves and cakes and tomatoes, etc., and felt that the thing would soon become exciting. It did. They started with breaking a cup. That was the first thing they did. They did that just to show what they could do, and to get you interested. Then Harris packed the strawberry jam on top of a tomato and squashed it. And they had to pick out the tomato with a teaspoon, and then it was George's turn, and he trod on the butter. I didn't say anything, but I came over and sat on the edge of the table and watched them. It irritated them more than anything I could have said. I felt that it made them nervous and excited, and they stepped on things and put things behind them, and then couldn't find them when they wanted them, and they packed the pies at the bottom and put heavy things on top and smashed the pies in. They upset salt over everything, and as for the butter, I never saw two men do more with one and two pence worth of butter in my whole life than they did. After George had got it off his slipper, they tried to put it in the kettle. It wouldn't go in, and what was in wouldn't come out. They did scrape it out at last and put it down on a chair, and Harris sat on it, and it stuck to him, and they went looking for it all over the room. 
I'll take my oath I put it down on that chair, said George, staring at the empty seat. I saw you do it myself, not a minute ago, said Harris. Then they started round the room again, looking for it, and then they met again in the center and stared at one another. Most extraordinary thing I ever heard of, said George. So mysterious, said Harris. Then George got round at the back of Harris and saw it. Why, here it is all the time, he exclaimed indignantly. Where, cried Harris, spinning round. Stand still, can't you, roared George, flying after him. And they got it off and packed it in the teapot. Montmorency was in it all, of course. Montmorency's ambition in life is to get in the way and be sworn at. If he can squirm in anywhere where he particularly is not wanted, and be a perfect nuisance and make people mad and have things thrown at his head, then he feels his day has not been wasted. To get somebody to stumble over him and curse him steadily for an hour is his highest aim and object, and... When he has succeeded in accomplishing this, his conceit becomes quite unbearable. He came and sat down on things, just when they were wanted to be packed, and he labored under the fixed belief that, whenever Harris or George reached out their hand for anything, it was his cold, damp nose that they wanted. He put his leg into the jam, and he worried the teaspoons, and he pretended that the lemons were rats, and got into the hamper and killed three of them before Harris could land him with the frying pan. Harris said I encouraged him. I didn't encourage him. A dog like that don't want any encouragement. It's the natural, original sin that is born in him that makes him do things like that. The packing was done at 12.50, and Harris sat on the big hamper, and said he hoped nothing would be found broken. George said if anything was broken, it was broken, which reflection seemed to comfort him. He also said he was ready for bed. We were all ready for bed. Harris was to sleep with us that night, and we went upstairs. We tossed for beds, and Harris had to sleep with me. He said, do you prefer the inside or the outside, Jay? I said I generally prefer to sleep inside a bed. Harris said it was old. George said, What time shall I wake you fellows? Harris said, Seven. I said, No, six, because I wanted to write some letters. Harris and I had a bit of a row over it, but at last split the difference and said half past six. Wake us at 6.30, George, we said. George made no answer, and we found, on going over, that he had been asleep for some time. So we placed the bath where he could tumble into it on getting out in the morning and went to bed ourselves. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 It was Mrs. Poppet that woke me up the next morning. She said, Do you know it's nearly nine o'clock, sir? Nine o'what? I cried, starting up. Nine o'clock, she replied, through the keyhole. I thought you was a oversleeping yourselves. I woke Harris and told him. He said, I thought you wanted to get up at six. So I did, I answered. Why didn't you wake me? How could I wake you when you didn't wake me? He retorted. Now we shan't get on the water till after twelve. I wonder you take the trouble to get up at all. Um, I replied, lucky for you that I do. If I hadn't woke you, you'd have lain there for the whole fortnight. We snarled at one another in this strain for the next few minutes, when we were interrupted by a defiant snore from George. It reminded us, for the first time since our being called, of his existence. There he lay, the man who had wanted to know what time he should wake us, on his back, with his mouth wide open and his knees stuck up. I don't know why it should be, I'm sure, but the sight of another man asleep in bed when I am up maddens me. It seems to me so shocking to see the precious hours of a man's life, the priceless moments that will never come back to him again, being wasted in mere brutish sleep. There was George, throwing away in hideous sloth the inestimable gift of time, his valuable life, every second of which he would have to account for hereafter, passing away from him, unused. He might have been up stuffing himself with eggs and bacon, 
irritating the dog, or flirting with the slevy, instead of sprawling there, sunk in soul-clogging oblivion. It was a terrible thought. Harris and I appeared to be struck by it at the same instant. We determined to save him, and, in this noble resolve, our own dispute was forgotten. We flew across and slung the clothes off him, and Harris landed him one with a slipper, and I shouted in his ear, and he awoke. "'What's the matter?' he observed, sitting up. "'Get up, you fat-headed chunk!' roared Harris. "'It's quarter to ten. "'What?' he shrieked, jumping out of bed and into the bath. "'Who the thunder put this thing here?' We told him he must have been a fool not to see the bath. We finished dressing, and when we came to the extras, we remembered that we had packed the toothbrushes and the brush and comb. That toothbrush of mine will be the death of me, I know, and we had to go downstairs and fish them out of the bag. And when we had done that, George wanted the shaving tackle. We told him that he would have to go without shaving that morning, as we weren't going to unpack that bag again for him, nor for anyone like him. He said, Don't be absurd. How can I go into the city like this? It was certainly rather rough on the city, but what cared we for human suffering? As Harris said, in his common vulgar way, the city would have to lump it. We went downstairs to breakfast. Montmorency had invited two other dogs to come and see him off, and they were whiling away the time by fighting on the doorstep. We calmed them with an umbrella, and sat down to chops and cold beef. Harris said, The great thing is to make a good breakfast, and he started with a couple of chops, saying that he would take these while they were hot, as the beef could wait. George got hold of the paper, and read us out the boating fatalities and the weather forecast, which latter prophesied rain, cold, wet to fine, whatever more than usually ghastly thing in weather that may be, occasional local thunderstorms, east wind, with general depression over the Midland counties, London and Channel, bar, falling. I do think that, of all the silly, irritating foolishness by which we are plagued, this weather forecast fraud is about the most aggravating. It forecasts precisely what happened yesterday, or the day before, and precisely the opposite of what is going to happen today. I remember a holiday of mine being completely ruined one late autumn by our paying attention to the weather report of the local newspaper. Heavy showers with thunderstorms may be expected today, it would say on Monday, and so we would give up our picnic and stop indoors all day, waiting for the rain. And people would pass the house, going off in wagonettes and coaches as jolly and merry as could be, the sun shining out and not a cloud to be seen. Ah, we said, as we stood looking out at them through the window, won't they come home soaked? And we chuckled to think how wet they were going to get, and came back and stirred the fire, and got our books, and arranged our specimens of seaweed and cockle shells. By twelve o'clock, with the sun pouring into the room, the heat became quite oppressive, and we wondered when those heavy showers and occasional thunderstorms were going to begin. Ah, they'll come in the afternoon, you'll find, we said to each other. Oh, won't those people get wet! What a lark! At one o'clock, the landlady would come in and ask if we weren't going out, as it seemed such a lovely day. No, no, we replied, with a knowing chuckle, not we. We don't mean to get wet, no, no. And when the afternoon was nearly gone, and still there was no sign of rain, we tried to cheer ourselves up with the idea that it would come down all at once, just as the people had started for home, and were out of the reach of any shelter, and that they would thus get more drenched than ever. But not a drop ever fell, and it finished a grand day, with a lovely night after it. The next morning we would read that it was going to be a warm, fine to set fair day, much heat, and we would dress ourselves in flimsy things, and go out, and half an hour after we had started, it would commence to rain hard, and a bitterly cold wind would spring up, and both would keep on steadily for the whole day, and we would come home with colds and rheumatism all over us, and go to bed. The weather is a thing that is beyond me altogether. I never can understand it. The barometer is useless. It is as misleading as the newspaper forecast. 
There was one hanging up in a hotel at Oxford, at which I was staying last spring, and when I got there it was pointing to Set Fair. It was simply pouring with rain outside, and had been all day, and I couldn't quite make matters out. I tapped the barometer, and it jumped up and pointed to Very Dry. The boot stopped as he was passing, and said he expected it meant tomorrow. I fancied that maybe it was thinking of the week before last, but Boots said no, he thought not. I tapped it again the next morning, and it went up still higher, and the rain came down faster than ever. On Wednesday I went and hit it again, and the pointer went round towards Set Fair, very dry, and much heat, until it was stopped by the peg, and couldn't go any further. It tried its best, but the instrument was built so that it couldn't prophesy fine weather any harder than it did without breaking itself. It evidently wanted to go on, and prognosticate drought, and water famine, and sunstroke, and simoons and such things, but the peg prevented it, and it had to be content with pointing to the mere commonplace very dry. Meanwhile the rain came down in a steady torrent, and the lower part of the town was under water owing to the river having overflowed. Boots said it was evident that we were going to have a prolonged spell of grand weather some time, and read out a poem which was printed over the top of the oracle about long foretold, long last, short notice, soon past. The fine weather never came that summer. I expect that machine must have been referring to the following spring. Then there are those new style of barometers, the long, straight ones. I never can make head or tail of those. There is one side for 10 a.m. yesterday, and one side for 10 a.m. today, but you can't always get there as early as 10, you know. It rises or falls for rain and fine, with much or less wind, and one end is nully, and the other is ely. What's ely got to do with it? And if you tap it, it doesn't tell you anything. You've got to correct it to sea level, and reduce it to Fahrenheit, and even then I don't know the answer. But who wants to be foretold the weather? It's bad enough when it comes, without our having the misery of knowing about it beforehand. The prophet we like is the old man who, on the particularly gloomy-looking morning of some day when we particularly want it to be fine, looks round the horizon with a particularly knowing eye, and says, Oh no, sir, I think it will clear up all right. It will break all right enough, sir. Ah, he knows, we say, as we wish him a good morning and start off. Wonderful how these old fellows can tell. And we feel an affection for that man which is not at all lessened by the circumstances of it not clearing up, but continuing to rain steadily all day. Ah well, we feel, he did his best. For the man that prophesies us bad weather, on the contrary, we entertain only bitter and revengeful thoughts. Going to clear up, do you think? We shout cheerily as we pass. Well, no, sir. I'm afraid it's settled down for the day, he replies, shaking his head. Stupid old fool, we mutter. What's he know about it? and, if his portent proves correct, we come back feeling still more angry against him, and with a vague notion that, somehow or other, he has had something to do with it. It was too bright and sunny on this especial morning for George's blood-curdling readings about bar falling, atmospheric disturbance, passing in an oblique line over southern Europe, and pressure increasing to very much upset us. And so, finding that he could not make us wretched, and was only wasting his time, he sneaked the cigarette that I had carefully rolled up for myself, and went. Then Harris and I, having finished up the few things left on the table, carried out our luggage to the doorstep, and waited for a cab. There seemed a good deal of luggage when we put it all together. There was the Gladstone, and the small handbag, and the two hampers and a large roll of rugs, and some four or five overcoats and mackintoshes, and a few umbrellas, and then there was a melon by itself in a bag, because it was too bulky to go in elsewhere, 
and a couple of pounds of grapes in another bag, and a Japanese paper umbrella, and a frying pan, which being too long to pack, we had wrapped round with brown paper. It did look a lot, and Harris and I began to feel rather ashamed of it, though why we should be I can't see. No cab came by, but the street boys did, and got interested in the show, apparently, and stopped. Biggs's boy was the first to come round. Biggs is our greengrocer, and his chief talent lies in securing the services of the most abandoned and unprincipled errand boys that civilization has yet produced. If anything more than unusually villainous in the boy line crops up in our neighbourhood, we know that it is Biggs's latest. I was told that, at the time of the great Coram Street murder, it was promptly concluded by our street that Biggs's boy, for that period, was at the bottom of it. And had he not been able, in reply to the severe cross-examination to which he was subjected by number 19, when he called there for orders the morning after the crime, assisted by number 21, who happened to be on the step at the time, to prove a complete alibi, it would have gone hard with him. I didn't know Biggs's boy at that time, but, from what I have seen of them since, I should not have attached much importance to that alibi myself. Biggs's boy, as I have said, came round the corner. He was evidently in a great hurry when he first dawned upon the vision, but on catching sight of Harris and me, and Montmorency, and the things, he eased up and stared. Harris and I frowned at him. This might have wounded a more sensitive nature, but Biggs's boys are not, as a rule, touchy. He came to a dead stop, a yard from our step, and, lining up against the railings, and selecting a straw to chew, fixed us with his eye. He evidently meant to see this thing out. In another moment, the grocer's boy passed on the opposite side of the street. Biggs's boy hailed him. Hi, ground floor of 42's are moving. The grocer's boy came across and took up a position on the other side of the step. Then the young gentleman from the boot shop stopped and joined Biggs's boy, while the empty can superintendent from the Blue Posts took up an independent position on the curb. They ain't a going to starve, are they? said the gentleman from the boot shop. Ah, you'd want to take a thing or two with you, retorted the Blue Posts, if you was a-going to cross the Atlantic in a small boat. They ain't a-going to cross the Atlantic, struck in Biggs's boy. They're a-going to find Stanley. By this time, quite a small crowd had collected, and people were asking each other what was the matter. One party, the young and giddy portion of the crowd, held that it was a wedding, and pointed out Harris as the bridegroom, while the elder and more thoughtful among the populace inclined to the idea that it was a funeral, and that I was probably the corpse's brother. At last an empty cab turned up. It is a street where, as a rule, and when they are not wanted, empty cabs pass at the rate of three a minute, and hang about and get in your way and packing ourselves and our belongings into it, and shooing out a couple of Montmorency's friends, who had evidently sworn never to forsake him, we drove away amidst the cheers from the crowd, Biggs's boy shying a carrot after us, for luck. We got to Waterloo at eleven, and asked where the eleven five started from. Of course, nobody knew. Nobody at Waterloo ever does know where a train is going to start from, or where a train, when it does start, is going to, or anything about it. The porter who took our things thought it would go from number two platform, while another porter, with whom he discussed the question, had heard a rumour that it would go from number one. The station master, on the other hand, was convinced it would start from the local. To put an end to the matter, we went upstairs and asked the traffic superintendent, and he told us that he had just met a man who said he had seen it at number three platform. We went to number three platform, but the authorities there said that they rather thought that the train was the Southampton Express, or else the Windsor Loop. But they were sure it wasn't the Kingston train, though why they were sure it wasn't, they couldn't say. 
Then our porter said he thought that must be it on the high-level platform, and he thought he knew the train. So we went to the high-level platform and saw the engine driver and asked him if he was going to Kingston. He said he couldn't say for certain, of course, but he rather thought he was. Anyhow, if he wasn't the 11.5 for Kingston, he said he was pretty confident that he was the 9.32 for Virginia Water or the 10 a.m. Express for the Isle of Wight or somewhere in that direction. And we should all know when we got there. We slipped half a crown into his hand and begged him to be the 11.5 for Kingston. Nobody will ever know on this line, we said, what you are or where you're going. You know the way. You slip off quietly and go to Kingston. Well, I don't know, gents, replied the noble fellow. But I suppose some trains got to go to Kingston, and I'll do it. Give me the half crown. Thus, we got to Kingston by the London and South Western Railway. We learnt afterwards that the train we had come by was really the Exeter Mail, and that they spent hours at Waterloo looking for it, and nobody knew what had become of it. Our boat was waiting for us at Kingston just below the bridge, and to it we wended our way, and round it we stored our luggage, and into it we stepped. "'Are you all right, sir?' said the man. "'Right it is,' we answered, and with Harris at the skulls, and I at the tiller lines, and Montmorency, unhappy and deeply suspicious in the prow, out we shot on to the waters which, for a fortnight, were to be our home. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 Kingston Instructive Remarks on Early English History Instructive Observations on Carved Oak and Life in General The Sad Case of Stivings, Jr. Musings on Antiquity I Forget That I Am Steering Interesting result. Hampton Court maze. Harris, as a guide. It was a glorious morning, late spring or early summer, as you care to take it, when the dainty sheen of grass and leaf is blushing to a deeper green, and the year seems like a fair young maid, trembling with strange wakening pulses on the brink of womanhood. The quaint back streets of Kingston, where they come down to the water's edge, looked quite picturesque in the flashing sunlight. The glinting river with its drifting barges, the wooded towpath, the trim-kept villas on the other side. Harris, in a red and orange blazer, grunting away at the skulls, the distant glimpses of the grey old palace of the Tudors, all made a sunny picture, so bright but calm, so full of life and yet so peaceful that, early in the day though it was, I felt myself being dreamily lulled off into a musing fit. I mused on Kingston, or Kingston, as it was once called in the days when Saxon kings were crowned there. Great Caesar crossed the river there, and the Roman legions camped upon its sloping uplands. Caesar, like in later years Elizabeth, seems to have stopped everywhere. Only he was more respectable than good Queen Bess. He didn't put up at public houses. She was nuts on public houses, was England's virgin queen. There's scarcely a pub of any attractions within ten miles of London that she does not seem to have looked in at, or stopped at, or slept at, some time or another. I wonder now, supposing Harris, say, turned over a new leaf and became a great and good man, got to be Prime Minister, and died, if they'd put up signs over the public houses that he had patronized. Harris had a glass of bitter in this house. Harris had two of Scotch cold here in the summer of 88. Harris was chucked from here in December 1886. No, there'd be too many of them. It would be the houses he'd never entered that would become famous. Only house in South London that Harris never had a drink in. The people would flock to it to see what could have been the matter with it. How poor, weak-minded King Edwy must have hated Kinnigston, 
The coronation feast had been too much for him. Maybe boar's head stuffed with sugar plums did not agree with him. It wouldn't with me, I know. And he'd had enough of sack and mead, so he slipped off from the noisy revel to steal a quiet moonlit hour with his beloved Elgiva. Perhaps from the casement, standing hand in hand, they were watching the calm moonlight of the river, while from the distant hills the boisterous revelry floated in broken bursts of faint-heard din and tumult. Then brutal Odo and St. Dunstan force their rude way into the quiet room and hurl coarse insults at the sweet-faced queen and drag poor Edwy back to the loud clamor of the drunken brawl. Years later, to the crash of battle music, Saxon kings and Saxon revelry were buried side by side, and Kingston's greatness passed away for a time to rise once more when Hampton Court became the palace of the Tudors and the Stuarts, and the royal barges strained at their moorings on the river's bank, and bright-cloaked gallants swaggered down the water steps to cry, What fairy ho! Gadzooks! Gramercy! Many of the old homes round about speak very plainly of the days when Kingston was a royal borough, and nobles and courtiers lived there near their king, and the long road to the palace gates were gay all day, with clanking steel and prancing palfreys, and rustling silks and velvets and fair faces. The large and spacious houses, with their oriel, latticed windows, their huge fireplaces and their gabled roofs, breathe of the days of hose and doublet, of pearl-embroidered stomachers and complicated oaths. They were upraised in the days when men knew how to build. The hard red bricks have only grown more firmly set with time, and their oak stairs do not creak and grunt when you try and go down them quietly. Speaking of oak staircases, reminds me that there is a magnificent carved oak staircase in one of the houses in Kingston. It is a shop now in the marketplace, but it was evidently once the mansion of some great personage. A friend of mine who lives in Kingston went in there to buy a hat one day, and in a thoughtless moment put his hand in his pocket and paid for it then and there. The shopman, he knows my friend, was naturally a little staggered at first, but quickly recovering himself and feeling that something ought to be done to encourage this sort of thing, asked our hero if he would like to see some fine old carved oak. My friend said he would, and the shopman thereupon took him through the shop and up the staircase of the house. The balusters were a superb piece of workmanship, and the wall all the way up was oak paneled with carving that would have done credit to a palace. From the stairs they went into the drawing room, which was a large bright room, decorated with a somewhat startling, though cheerful, paper of a blue ground. There was nothing, however, remarkable about the apartment, and my friend wondered why he had been brought there. The proprietor went up to the paper and tapped it. It gave forth a wooden sound. Oak, he explained, all carved oak, right up to the ceiling, just the same as you saw on the staircase. "'But, great Caesar, man!' expostulated my friend. Y "'You don't mean to say you've covered over carved oak with blue wallpaper?' "'Yes,' was the reply. "'It was expensive work. "'Had to matchboard it all over at first, of course. "'But the room looks cheerful now. "'It was awful gloomy before.' "'I can't say I altogether blame the man, "'which is doubtless a great relief to his mind.' From his point of view, which would be that of the average householder, desiring to take life as lightly as possible, and not that of the old curiosity shop maniac, there is reason on his side. Carved oak is very pleasant to look at, and to have a little of, but it is no doubt somewhat depressing to live in for those whose fancy does not lie that way. It would be like living in a church. No. What was sad in his case was that he, who didn't care for carved oak, should have his drawing-room panelled in it, while people who do care for it have to pay enormous prices to get it. It seems to be the rule of this world. Every person has what he doesn't want, and other people have what he does want. 
Married men have wives and don't seem to want them, and young single fellows cry out that they can't get them. Poor people who can hardly keep themselves have eight hearty children. Rich old couples with no one to leave their money to die childless. Then there are the girls with lovers. The girls that have lovers never want them. They say they'd rather be without them and that they bother them. And why don't they go and make love to Miss Smith and Miss Brown, who are plain and elderly, and haven't got any lovers? They themselves don't want lovers. They never mean to marry. It does not do to dwell on these things. It makes one so sad. There was a boy at our school. We used to call him Sandford and Merton. His real name was Stivings. He was the most extraordinary lad I have ever come across. I believe he really liked study. He used to get into awful rows for sitting up in bed and reading Greek. And as for French irregular verbs, there was simply no keeping him away from them. He was full of weird and unnatural notions about being a credit to his parents and an honor to the school. He yearned to win prizes and grow up and be a clever man, and had all those sorts of weak-minded ideas. I never knew such a strange creature, yet harmless, mind you, as the babe unborn. Well, that boy used to get ill about twice a week so that he couldn't go to school. There was never such a boy to get ill as that Sandiford and Merton. If there was any known disease going within ten miles of him, he had it and had it badly. He would take bronchitis in the dog days and have hay fever at Christmas. After a six weeks period of drought, he would be stricken down with rheumatic fever, and he would go out in a November fog and come home with the sunstroke. They put him under laughing gas one year, poor lad, and drew out all his teeth and gave him a false set because he suffered so terribly with toothache. Then it turned to neuralgia and earache. He was never without a cold, except once for nine weeks when he had the scarlet fever, and he always had chilblains. During the great cholera scare of 1871, our neighborhood was singularly free of it. There was only one reputed case in the whole parish. And that case was young Stivings. He had to stop in bed when he was ill and eat chicken and custards and hothouse grapes. And he would lie there and sob because they wouldn't let him do Latin exercises and took his German grammar away from him. And we other boys, who would have sacrificed ten terms of our school life for the sake of being ill for a day, and had no desire whatever to give our parents any excuse for being stuck up about us, couldn't catch so much as a stiff neck. We fooled about in drafts, and it did us good and freshened us up. And we took things to make us sick, and they made us fat and gave us an appetite. Nothing we could think of seemed to make us ill until the holidays began. Then, on the breaking up day, we caught colds and whooping cough and all kinds of disorders, which lasted until the term recommenced, when, in spite of everything we could maneuver to the contrary, we would suddenly get well again and be better than ever. Such is life, and we are but grass that is cut down and put into the oven and baked. To go back to the carved oak question, they must have had very fair notions of the artistic and the beautiful, our great-grandfathers. Why, all our art treasures of the today are only the dug-up commonplaces of three or four hundred years ago. I wonder if there is real intrinsic beauty in the old soup plates, beer mugs, and candle snuffers that we prize so now, or if it is only the halo of age glowing around them that gives them their charms in our eyes. The old blue that we hang about our walls as ornaments were the common everyday household utensils of a few centuries ago and the pink shepherds and the yellow shepherdesses that we hand round now for all our friends to gush over and pretend they understand were the unvalued mantle ornaments that the mother of the 18th century would have given the baby to suck when he cried. Will it be the same in the future? Will the prized treasures of today always be the cheap trifles of the day before? Will rows of our willow-patterned dinner plates be ranged above the chimney-pieces of the great in the year two thousand and odd? 
Well, the white cups with gold rims and beautiful gold flower inside, species unknown, that our Sarah Janes now break in sheer light-heartedness of spirit, be carefully mended and stood upon a bracket and dusted only by the lady of the house. That china dog that ornaments the bedroom of my furnished lodgings, it is a white dog, its eyes blue, its nose is a delicate red with spots, its head is painfully erect, its expression is amiability carried to the verge of imbecility. I do not admire it myself. Considered as a work of art, I may say it irritates me. Thoughtless friends jeer at it, and even my landlady herself has no admiration for it, and excuses its presence by the circumstance that her aunt gave it to her. But in two hundred years' time, it is more than probable that the dog will be dug up from somewhere or other, minus its legs and with its tail broken, and will be sold for old china and put in a glass cabinet, and people will pass it round and admire it. They will be struck by the wonderful depth of color on the nose, and speculate as to how beautiful the bit of the tail that is lost no doubt was. We, in this age, do not see the beauty of that dog. We are too familiar with it. It is like the sunset and the stars. We are not awed by their loveliness because they are common in our eyes. So it is with the China dog. In 2288, people will gush over it. The making of such dogs will have become a lost art. Our descendants will wonder at how we did it and say how clever we were. We shall be referred to lovingly as those grand old artists that flourished in the 19th century and produced those China dogs. The sampler that the eldest daughter did at school would be spoken of as tapestry of the Victorian era and be almost priceless. The blue and white mugs of the present day roadside inn will be hunted up all cracked and chipped and sold for their weight in gold, and rich people will use them for claret cups, and travelers from Japan will buy up all the presents from Ramsgate and souvenirs of Margate that may have escaped destruction and take them back to Jedo as ancient English curios. At this point, Harris threw down the skulls, got up and left his seat, and sat on his back, and stuck his legs in the air. Montmorency howled and turned a somersault, and the top hamper jumped up and all the things came out. I was somewhat surprised, but did not lose my temper. I said, pleasantly enough, Hello, what's that for? What's that for? Why? Now, on second thought, I will not repeat what Harris said. I may have been to blame, I admit it, but nothing excuses violence of language and coarseness of expression, especially on a man who has been carefully brought up, as I know Harris had been. I was thinking of other things, and forgot, as anyone might easily understand, that I was staring, and the consequence was that we'd got mixed up a good deal with the towpath. It was difficult to say for a moment which was us and which was the Middlesex bank of the river, but we found out after a while and separated ourselves. Harris, however, said that he had done enough for a bit and proposed that I should take a turn. So, as we were in, I got out and took the tow line and ran the boat on past Hampton Court. What a dear old wall that is that runs along the river there. I never pass it without feeling better for the sight of it. Such a mellow, bright, sweet old wall. What a charming picture it would make, with the lichen creeping here and the moss growing there. A shy young vine peeping over the top of this spot to see what is going on upon the busy river, and the sober old ivy clustering a little further down. There are fifty shades and tints and hues in every ten yards of that old wall. If I could only draw and I knew how to paint, I could make a lovely sketch of that old wall, I'm sure. I've often thought I should like to live at Hampton Court. It looks so peaceful and so quiet, and it is such a dear old place to ramble round in the early morning before many people are about. But there, I don't suppose I should really care for it when it came to actual practice. It would be so ghastly dull and depressing in the evening, when your lamp cast uncanny shadows on the panelled walls, 
and the echo of distant feet rang through the cold stone corridors, and now drew nearer, and now died away, and all was death-like silence, save the beating of one's own heart. We are creatures of the sun, we men and women. We love light and life. That is why we crowd into the towns and cities, and the country grows more and more deserted every year. In the sunlight, in the daytime, when nature is alive and busy all about us, we like the open hillsides and the deep woods well enough. But in the night, when our mother earth has gone to sleep and left us waking, oh, the world seems so lonesome, and we get frightened like children in a silent house. Then we sit and sob and long for the gaslit streets and the sound of human voices and the answering throb of human life. We feel so helpless and so little in the great stillness when the dark trees rustle in the night wind. There are so many ghosts about, and their silent sighs make us feel so sad. Let us gather together in the great cities and light huge bonfires of a million gas jets and shout and sing together and feel brave. Harris asked me if I'd ever been to the maze at Hampton Court. He said he went in once to show somebody else the way. He'd studied it up on a map, and it was so simple it seemed foolish, hardly worth the twopence charged for admission. Harris said he thought the map must have been got up as a practical joke because it wasn't a bit like the real thing and only misleading. It was a country cousin that Harris took in. He said, well, just go in here so that you can say you've been, but it's very simple. It's absurd to call it a maze. You keep on taking the first turning to the right. We'll just walk round for ten minutes and then go and get some lunch. They met some people soon after they had got inside who said they'd been there for three quarters of an hour and had had about enough of it. Harris told them they could follow him if they liked. He was just going in and then should turn around and come out again. They said it was very kind of him and fell behind and followed. They picked up various other people who wanted to get it over as they went along until they had absorbed all the persons in the maze, people who'd given up all hopes of ever getting either in or out or of ever seeing their home and friends again, plucked up courage at the sight of Harris and his party and joined the procession, blessing him. Harris said he should judge there must have been twenty people following him in all and one woman with a baby, who'd been in there all morning, insisted on taking his arm for fear of losing him. Harris kept on turning to the right, but it seemed a long way, and his cousin said he supposed it was a very big maze. Oh, one of the largest in Europe, said Harris. Yes, it must be, replied the cousin, because we've walked a good two miles already. Harris began to think it rather strange himself, but he held on until, at last, they passed the half of a penny bun on the ground that Harris's cousin swore he had noticed there seven minutes ago. Harris said, Oh, impossible! But the woman with the baby said, Not at all, as she herself had taken it from the child and thrown it down there just before she met Harris. She also added that she wished she never met Harris and expressed an opinion that he was an impostor. This made Harris mad, and he produced his map and explained his theory. "'The map may be all right enough,' said one of the party, "'if you know whereabouts in it we are now.' Harris didn't know, and suggested the best thing to do would be to go back to the entrance and begin again. For the beginning again part, there was not much enthusiasm, but with regards to the advisability of going back to the entrance, there was complete unanimity, and so they turned and trailed after Harris again in the opposite direction. About ten minutes more passed, and then they found themselves in the center. Harris thought at first of pretending that that was what he had been aiming at, but the crowd looked dangerous, and he decided to treat it like an accident. Anyhow, they had got something to start from then. They did know where they were, and the map was once more consulted, and the thing seemed simpler than ever, and off they started for the third time. And three minutes later they were back at the center again. After that they simply couldn't get anywhere else. Whatever way they turned brought them back to the middle. It became so regular at length that some of the people stopped there and waited for the others to take a walk round and come back to them. 
Harris drew out his map again, after a while, but the sight of it only infuriated the mob, and they told him to go and curl his hair with it. Harris said that he couldn't help feeling that, to a certain extent, he had become unpopular. They all got crazy at last and sang out for the keeper, and the man came and climbed up the ladder outside and shouted out directions to them. But all their heads were, by this time, in such a confused whirl that they were incapable of grasping anything, and so the man told them to stop where they were and he would come to them. They huddled together and waited, and he climbed down and came in. He was a young keeper, as luck would have it, and new to the business, and when he got in, he couldn't find them, and he wandered about trying to get to them, and then he got lost. They caught sight of him every now and then, rushing about the other side of the hedge, and he would see them, and rush to get to them, and they would wait there for about five minutes, and then he would reappear again in exactly the same spot, and ask them where they had been. They had to wait till one of the old keepers came back from his dinner before they got out. Harris said he thought it a very fine maze, so far as he was a judge, and we agreed that we would try to get George to go into it on our way back. End of chapter 6. Recording by Vinnie Tesla. Other audiobooks and writing available at vinnytesla.com.